we are going through one of the best divisions, nay, the best division in football, the AFC East. We're talking about the hard knocks hero himself, Aaron Rodgers. We've got some great debate on today's show. Make sure you leave a comment, subscribe, and enjoy. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. Thursday. July 13th, the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Mike, the Fantasy Hitman Wright, is here. Jason Moore, I'm Andy Holloway. Big show today. Excited to be with you, Mike. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Yeah. We are on to the AFC East, Mm. which is a very, very fun division. It's a ferocious division. Yes. Yes. Uh, we found out that Hard Knocks will be heading to the AFC East. They will uh, this morning. And bring uh, your ayahuasca. Bring your ayahuasca. B Y O. B Y O A. Yeah. Okay. Um, took me a second. Jason, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. I just got out of a dark room. Uh, so the, you, you what were just, you doing in a dark room? Oh, just like Aaron Rodgers. Oh, you got the ayahuasca. Oh. You got the you got the complete. Now, are you just talking about your bedroom from last night? Yeah, like, I'm, but like <laughs> blackout curtains, man. It's crazy. Uh, we're all in the black shirts today. That's you know, right. I did notice that. Well, that's the best to absorb the Arizona sun. Yes, <laughs> that's <laughs> really smart. Sometimes you got to challenge. You got you you got to look at the sun and say, "I am I'm tougher than you." We used to star. play. <laughs> we used to <laughs> I'm tougher than you, star. <laughs> we used to play a lot of pickleball outdoors. Now we are fortunate enough that we play indoors during the summer. Yeah. We're soft now. Uh, we're soft. I, I, I said this the other day, um, to somebody, they're like, they were playing outside and I'm like, you're a maniac. And then I was like, I realized I've yeah, just become we're soft little soft baby boys and pale because we were getting tans along with the melanoma. But, uh, we used to play a lot of pickleball outdoors and like wearing a black pickleball shirt, mm, mm-hmm. very bad decision. Mm-hmm. And yet, Al Borland and Jason oh, yeah. would not play pickleball out there with light color on. Very committed. I'm not into having a wet t-shirt contest <laughs> out there, boys. <laughs> that black shirt's necessary. Oh, but you guys, you guys like maybe almost died a few times. Yeah, but so what, you know? <laughs> every man dies. Not every man truly lives. Uh, very slimming. But uh, welcome in, everybody. AFC East breakdown on the show today. We have a best ball breakdown as well. Some decent NFL news to talk about, which like we had been kind of pining for that for a while. We hadn't had any big stories. We got stuff to discuss and break down and, and look at the implications. Um, the Ultimate Draft Kit is available right now at ultimatedraftkit.com. If you're new, this is the uh, this is the secret weapon for your draft. So you can learn about everything that's a part of it. We've been building on it for years. So um, if you think back to the early days of the Ultimate Draft Kit, it's probably three, four times as robust and useful and iterated on and improved upon. And so that is uh, that's something you can avail yourself of at ultimatedraftkit.com. We have a new Dynasty podcast episode, Dynasty Wide Receivers, that released yesterday. You can search for the Fantasy Footballers Dynasty podcast. How'd that go, Jay? It was very, very good. We got into kind of the second tier wide receivers who we love, who we hate, some veterans. And I think we had a really great discussion on what to do with kind of veteran wide receivers. Very valuable. I only overheard one part of the recording, Mike, and it was Jason uh, disparaging. Uh, Joshua Dobbs again. Mm. Are you downs? Sorry. Yes. What did I say? Josh Dobbs. Dobbs. Oh, yeah. That, that's why you both looked at me th- very yeah, confused. I was trying like, to think what? of who what? that human is. Nope, nope. But, uh, yes, Josh Downs. Yeah. I, Dobbs was on Steelers, right? Am I remembering that? Yeah, the quarterback was, yes. yes. I, I was speaking of the wide receiver, the rookie. I've messed this up. I recognize it. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I did slander Josh Downs. It's been a while since I had an opportunity 
Um, and, and really, we still, shame, we still haven't seen him play. I didn't get. I don't get much opportunity to slander him anymore since he uh, did well, not get drafted highly. Correct. Correct. You know, so you have your first stage one victory lap. Right. He, the NFL. I'm did, on lap two right now. Are you? Yeah. Oh okay. yeah. How many laps can you make it through? Though? Four. That's that's when I quit. Okay. Um, what else is going on? Do I have anything else here? We do not need to talk about Joshua Dobbs for what it's worth. Yeah. Oh wait. He started the the, yeah. the couple games for the Titans. He did. Okay. He, he played for yeah, the, the Steelers for a that, while, and then last year had a chance. Yeah. After Malik Willis got his chance. Yes. And it's it was all evident, coming back. To it me was now. evident that off the street, Josh Dobbs was the better option for them. Hey, that's tough. Uh, Brooksy, anything else we got going on over there in Deucer's Alley? It's all all fill, filled up over there. No more uh, Jay Grizz. Happy to have my guys back. Yeah. Nothing yeah. else going on. Rap Scallion in the building as well. Um, okay, let's get it going. News and notes from around the league. The big news uh, that we've been waiting for, Saints, well, part of it. Saints running back Alvin Kamara pleaded no contest to a misdemeanor charge connected to his alleged participation in a fight that occurred in Las Vegas in 2022. So we've heard tale of this incident for a long time now. Um, he is going to do community service. It was reduced. It's not a felony. It's a misdemeanor. And he's going to pay 100000 to the victim for medical bills. This sets the stage for any uh, potential NFL consequences, uh, which we don't know if they're going to take place or not. I mean, I, I think we all have different guesses, but we've never seen this exact situation before. Yeah, this is, this is a new crime uh that the nfl will deal with but the nfl has come out and said now that this has uh been resolved they will look into this and investigate my expectation right now when i'm just statting players out and thinking about what i believe will happen because at this point in time that's what you got to do you got to make that guess if you're drafting on underdog or doing stuff you got to make your educated uh decisions and i believe it'll be a two-game suspension yeah i'm, I'm at one to two I think it'll be one to two. Mike, I think, was saying he he leans more yeah, the higher I, side. I think it could be. I think it could be up to four. It two wouldn't surprise me, but there's there there like the video is there's a video out. The video it's very difficult to tell what's going on in it, but we know that the the NFL does not like when you make a uh, when you make the news for bad PR. Uh, Roger Goodell and company often come down on it now uh so uh, the, i'm confident he will get a suspension uh but anywhere from two or more games that uh, that's tbd okay yeah i i think we'll find out soon colts owner jim ursay said jonathan taylor is quote healed up ahead of training camp he oh, had a okay. arthroscopic debridement which is one of oh, the things i try to avoid to clean up the ankle so, uh, you know, that's uh, debridement. That's like, clean, you know, getting rid of little bone fragments and stuff like that. Wouldn't that be right? That doesn't sound I don't sound know why I'm good. looking at Al. Al looks like a guy who knows what debridement is. <laughs> I, I did have my sinuses. I had that procedure You had them debrided? Yes. Is that how I, you would refer to it? I think it's called a debridement. Oh, de debridement. Oh. Yeah, de I could be Debridement wrong. is when you get divorced. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. and you're, yeah. there de is. you're debriding. You're debriding. <laughs> yeah. Uh, We're it, here all night. <laughs> it is... Um, kind of a, a storyline in the sense that you got to remember that he's still recovering. I know he said he's all healed up ahead of training camp, but he wasn't a part of any of the other camps, the OTAs, all that. He wasn't ready yet. So it's it's something to monitor. I mean, hopefully just it's a nothing, you know, training camp starts, he's a full go, but maybe, maybe not. Some news on Isaiah Pacheco. See if those fancy feet can get going. He may not be clear for the start of training camp. Played through a fracture in his thumb and a torn labrum in his shoulder. Under, underwent surgery. Um, you know, it, it doesn't really concern me at all because it's not his legs. <laughs> um, dealing with... I mean, a, a shoulder, that's, that's well, not the but, greatest for a running back who has to hit people with his shoulder. It, it, it does... I, I'm not that concerned. Let me put it that way. I don't want to say you shouldn't pay attention to it. I'm just saying the broken bone in the thumb. Look, he played through these injuries. Right. So so in that respect, you know, I'm just happy it's uh, upper body for this running back. Yeah, I, I still – I know I got a little bit of grief. Uh, this was 
wow, a month, two months ago when I brought up Clyde Edwards-Alaire's name as one of my favorite last-round picks in underdog. I will never give grief for that, Jason. I must hold on <laughs> to <laughs> any shred of hope. Oh, I'm happy. Clyde... I can give you grief now. Yeah. You don't have to just have it then. <laughs> uh, I, it's not changing. But, you know, this is one of those things where if he's not there to, for the start of training camp, Clyde Edwards-Alaire is not going away. He's not going to be uninvolved and uh it's a, it's a good offense so Derek McKinnon yeah I mean McKinnon will be involved as well it's a it's a three back rotation until it's a two back rotation when one of them gets injured uh and then Monday at 4 p.m eastern deadline for franchise tag players to sign a long-term deal our latest report from ESPN saying Saquon and the Giants are at a stalemate the deadline's Monday for a long-term deal the situation is basically if they don't reach that deal it's going to force Saquon to make a decision about holding out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and it will be a scary journey because he's probably – both Josh Jacobs and Saquon Barkley most likely will not have a deal done, and so their only option is to sit out or sign their franchise tag, and they will probably sign their franchise tag as late as humanly possible, miss – all of training camp, and it will be very tough to draft those players when you still have a fear of what them it, holding out. What are they holding out for at that point? If you can't to not practice, yeah, no, no, no. no I, exactly. I, I understand that, but like I'm talking about anything that would actually impact our. I mean, both those guys are the. They don't have to play it down. They don't even have to smell the grass on the training field. They will start week one. Oh yeah, both of them. So my point is, is like, what does holding out do for them? If they're gonna play week one, other than just missing some practice, like that's they what can't. It is. Okay, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean most people that... hold out because they want a contract. Most people hold out because they want to accomplish something. If the team cannot give them anything, that's my point. Well, like, the what, fear what of they the, the the fear of the holdout at that point is not missing training camp. It's that they will sit out the season, a la Le'Veon Bell. And but go, they're going to sacrifice all the franchise tag money that entire year. Yeah, I mean that's what Lev Bell did, and and yeah, but um, that was really dumb. And it, it was did, super it, dumb, and and he got a big contract afterwards from the Jets. And if you really did the math, he just lost money on even, even including the big contract. My point is that is it is it really one of those things that's all or nothing for this season? Because if you can't do anything to his contract. Why would he come back in game two? Why would he come back in game four? Oh, no. Why would he came back, come back in game six? No, it's, it's, it's all or nothing, 100%. And what it is going to be is no training camp and then sign. So you're in that regard, are you 0% worried about it as a draft pick for both those players? Mm, I, I was, I, until it's signed, I'll have that 1% worry okay. that he misses the whole season. Anything and, to add, Mike? I, just, I, I, I think we have data. Um, I don't have anything in front of me, Kyle. Maybe you have something behind the scenes, but just when a player, you know, kind of skips the conditioning that that acclimation period of training camp, their I think their injury rate is uh, is a bit higher. So they are they're already a risky position for for injury and draft costs. And if they're not like in football shape come week one, I, I don't know. It I think I think your antenna needs to be up. We all we all want it buttoned up. That would be nice to just know what you're getting. Yeah. Higher draft capital picks like that. You don't want anything. You know, Joe Mixon, Alvin Kamara, and once we find this out, like the question marks in the air do not make you feel good about it, which is why some of their average draft positions are lower. All right, let's get into it. Let's get divisional. All right. Let's have some fun. We're talking AFC East, going through the changes from 2022 to 23, how the offenses may function, um, kind of our takes on win totals. We'll do what we've done on all of these divisional breakdowns. We'll give you our predictions for uh, first, second, third, and fourth in the division. Last year, Buffalo, 13-3. and three. So good. Miami was 9-8. and eight. The Patriots were 8-9. And, and the New York Jets were 7-10. and 10. So this was a very uh, a pretty good division last year, but the Bills owned it. Number two in points per game, number two defense in points allowed. Um, you know they are one of those. You know sometimes you get concerned about teams when their defense is too good. Uh, but Josh Allen, Stephon Diggs, that wasn't the case. You know they were a very, um, you know they won almost all their games. 
They had a huge point differential, and yet those two players were still highly producing fantasy commodities. Yeah, I mean, the, the you know, you look at the Eagles last year as well. They had a great defense, and sometimes it, it capped. You know, you'd, you'd be at halftime, and you'd think, oh, I'm going to score a kajillion fantasy points, and they don't get that great second half. But you just want teams that are dominating. If they're up, that means they scored touchdowns. That means fantasy points came. And the Bills were unbelievable last year. They were 10 points away, under 10 points away, from having an undefeated season. You know, they had three losses, all three by three or fewer points, and they just kicked butt. And I, it's funny because their win totals come down. I'm sure some of that has to do with Aaron Rodgers showing up in the division. Tua, Miami being healthy. Yeah, exactly, Tua being there. Um, you, and it, there is a weird air of pessimism around the Bills, at least I've seen in media, where it's like they feel like the window is starting to shut. I don't see that. I don't, I, you know, uh, obviously Diggs is – getting older if, if we're talking dynasty leagues maybe you start getting worried start getting out of that but their offense should just be full steam ahead this year I don't see why, any reason why it should take a step back yeah I mean the the win total it goes from 11 and a half going into last year to 10 and a half this year like you said the offseason hijinks or whatever you want to call it from Stefan Diggs didn't help that uh, I guess, feeling about the season. They also had a very, very disappointing exit in the playoffs. You know, this was – last year was supposed to be their year, mm -hmm. and it just didn't transpire that way. Um, But, yeah, the core pieces, Josh Allen, he's going to be great. Stephon Diggs going to be great. Opportunities, they're there for Gabe Davis, Dalton Kincaid, uh, James Cook. So we'll talk about some of those guys, Sean McDermott, going into year seven somehow. Wow, that's – man, what? And uh, last three years, 13 wins, 11 huh. wins, 13 wins. And so, uh, you know, last year coming into the season, there was the change of offensive coordinator. Didn't matter, right? Uh, Ken Dorsey goes into year two now, and they've added Damian Harris at running back, Latavius Murray at running back to fill out that room. Uh, they've added Deontay Hardy and Trent yeah. Sherfield, a wide receiver. And they lost Jamison Crowder, Isaiah McKenzie, and – uh, Cole Beasley as well, right? I mean, Cole uh, Beasley yes. is gone. Yes. Yeah, they basically lost some slot players, added some slot players, and then Dalton Kincaid is the real difference in the offense. A first um, round, a first round tight end. Yeah, he's he's an excellent pass catching tight end. Um, great ball skills, great athleticism. He wasn't able to participate in the combine, but the hype on Dalton Kincaid is gigantic. If you watched the draft videos of this room, they you know they traded up to get him. They hopped over the Cowboys. They wanted him bad, and they felt like, like the, he could really help this offense. They keep calling him the tight end. Like, is that you, funny to you guys at all? When when we're watching a lot of these draft videos, they're not even yeah, calling these kids by their name. They're just like, ah, oh, we're hoping that the tight end falls. Like, you don't. What what are we doing here? But is that took him in the draft video? Not yeah, saying the tight end falls to him. Yeah. I don't know. It, well, you could you could argue that that that's extra hype on Dalton Kincaid because they're just saying the tight end, and they all knew who they were talking about. They weren't talking about Michael Mayer. They were talking about Dalton Kincaid, the tight end. It's worth it's worth saying, and I don't know if we've talked about it enough because there's been all the traditional hype around Dalton Kincaid. He goes to a great offense. We just talked about the points per game, and then you look at his fantasy potential, which for some that excitement's overblown. The historical numbers tell us that rookie tight ends is hard to make an impact. I get all that. But have we talked too little about the impact he might have on Josh Allen? Ooh, because excellent. a weapon like that doesn't have to be fantasy gold himself to turn Josh Allen into a uh, even a more consistent producer at that position more of a guarantee if you go in the second round on Josh Allen yeah you get around the goal line though or I would say more the red zone and all of a sudden you have another legitimate option to throw a touchdown to that stresses the defense and that will add more passing touchdowns to Josh Allen I, he's my quarterback one right now as far as how the stats lie I think he's got the highest potential I I just love Jalen Hurts so much, I find myself drafting him over him. But my stats have Josh Allen as the number one. And I, I want to bring up Gabe Davis real quick because, to me, I believe he is the quintessential post-hype sleeper. The, the, the Burns were real, super disappointing season. He was drafted and uh, touted. He was a my guy for me last year, and, and it was a failure. Um, he was too inconsistent, had a couple big weeks, 
but for the most part was a failure. But I think he was a failure predominantly because of the expectations and the hopes. Yeah, finished as the wide receiver 27. Yeah, he missed two games, had a high ankle sprain in week two, played through it, and was the wide receiver 27. So he's not worthless. And he only caught 52% of his Josh Allen targets. That's a number that I, I feel like should go north of that. And so he is unwanted in drafts. I believe he's going to be a really good value this year because there's not a lot of – if you just look at the situation, you say, okay, the wide receiver two for one of, if not the best offense in the league, who's going to get 100 targets, that's just a great opportunity. Now, if you think Gabe Davis just flat out sucks and can't get the job done, then pass that's, on him. That's the hard part is because the number – like if if he catches 50 – what did you say, 52% of the passes? Right. Like – that could very well be on him. I mean, Stephon Diggs caught 71%. I don't think Josh Allen was throwing, you know, knuckleballs to, to, to Gabe Davis. Maybe higher, you know, lower probability yes. catches. But we don't know what the team's trust is. Is this going to be um, an offense where they made that decision and then they said, look, it's going to be a lot of James Cook in the passing game. It's going to be Dalton Kincaid and 12 personnel with Dawson Knox. That That's where the gamble is. And it, it is a gamble on Gabe Davis, but he should be on the field a ton. And then at that point, it's about confidence for your quarterback. You're in a great offense. Uh, I do think there's opportunity there if you're being drafted in the ninth round. There's there's it's opportunity. Just be, be willing to cut bait if it's the same old Gabe Davis. But the the, the two guys I wanted to highlight of because that's the question for Gabe Davis. Is is Gabe Davis good? And I don't know that we well he could be a three the, too. I don't I mean, know that, that could, we have the answer yet. And like Khalil Shakir is he's an interesting slot wide receiver and Deontay Hardy is this dude is he is a burner like like um Hardy won't be really he'll be interesting like every once in a while for a DFS play but for a when you were talking about Dalton Kincaid improving things for Josh Allen there's gonna be three to five times that that Hardy hits with a with a with like a, with 40, a party yeah it's gonna be a Hardy party when he's hitting like a 40 plus yard touchdown and that'll be his only catch of the day yeah he's, he's a lot but, like uh, Jalen Guyton in he, Los Angeles but he's just he he will certainly help the the offense and I think that it will be interesting to watch camp for these wide receiver reports of uh, is the team back in support of Gabe Davis or do you start hearing more hype train stuff about these other two wide receivers if that's what we're hearing then then Gabe Davis is probably just not as good as we hope he is. Let's uh, before we move on. Let's talk about the running back position. James Cook right now being drafted in the eighth round of fantasy drafts. He averaged two point six nine yards before contact. That was number three among all running backs. But he only got twelve touches or more one time last year. So there's an argument to be made. We just didn't get to see James Cook unleashed in any capacity. Because of that, to me, there's an opportunity there. Right, like if if they were to give him more work, we've moved on from Devin Singletary. Plays on a great team. Seems like there's an opportunity. At the same time, Damian Harris was added and Latavius Murray, and I, I mention both because Murray just kind of gets it done and endears coaches to him. It seems, and so he ends up getting a little bit more work than we're comfortable with. Uh, maybe he hurts Damian Harris a little bit more as a potential sleeper. But what do you expect out of this room that has gent? generally been infrequently relied upon for fantasy football I don't think there's enough fantasy points to go around, uh, around for the running backs generally speaking and I mean it would it would be surprising to me if James Cook were unleashed if as we're, if we're talking about just volume he's not a big guy you know maybe around the 190 pound mark or so Damian Harris is a good running back if anyone's going to be the guy there at the goal line I mean, it's Josh Allen, but I'm saying if it's going to be a running back, it'll be Damian Harris. It's just how much passing work does James Cook get? I I don't think either of them is really desirable as as a later round running back, but be, there is ambiguity, and in ambiguity in a running back position, that's sometimes where gold comes from. For me, I'm putting my chips on on the Damian Harris side of things, just in case we see a you know a seven plus rushing touchdown season. When he had he had 13 opportunities two times and 20 opportunities, those were his three highest games. Fantasy finishes for Cook in those were 25, 15, and 10. 
in those games, averaging 7.8 a carry, 4.6 a carry, and 9 a carry. So we'll see how often they're willing to get him involved. If you watch the games, what I loved about James Cook is that he has the – I don't even know how to describe it. I don't know if somebody has an idea for it, but certain running backs, they know where to go after the ball is snapped. They find empty space. It's good vision. The turnaround zone, whatever you want to call that. Mm -hmm. James Cook was dominant in that, and that's one of the reasons they drafted him. Now, they didn't get to use him the, that way very often because I think he started his career with a fumble on his first touch, and they had other in weapons involved. But – just keep an eye on on that situation. Yeah, I, he, I think where's he going right now? Eighth round. I I think he's a it's fine, probably fair price. I think it's a fair price and a fine shot to take. If I was to make my bet, I'm going to make it on the James Cook side. I realize he has lower odds of being the goal line guy, but I don't think if if there's gold to be mined in these hills, it's not going to come <laughs> from just a, a goal line opportunity. It's going to come from being an explosive athlete in a great offense who has enough opportunity to break off big run after big run, chunk plays, and James Cook has that. He showed that last year, and if you look at how he started the season, 5% snaps, 26% snaps, 12, 3, 18, 14. Like, he wasn't really involved. Later in the season, he started getting up more around like the 40%, and had a couple big games. I think it, you, you we're hoping here that he could be a 55 60% snap player. And if that happens, oh yeah, hit it. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> you threw the you threw yeah. the 60 in there and uh, you could have just yeah. said you could have left it and I would have Well, I wasn't thinking about yeah. the drops, but yeah, I do think uh I would I would place my chips on the James Dalvin Cook side. He's a 442. Yes, 442. So, he's a pretty fast dude. All right, quick break back with the Dolphins. All right, let's talk about Miami. Last year, the projected win total was nine. They won nine games. This year is nine and a half. Uh, they were six and five in one score games. Which they can't do. Thank you, Mike. Just Thank you. Just here for the mathematical yeah, equations. Yeah, I mean, that's true. He, they will not win nine and a half games this year. Thank you. Impossible. Um, they were eight and three, though, when Tua started and finished the game. Important to throw that in there, the and finished part. Uh, one and six in the other game. So, I mean, this was a very good football team. To be six and five in one score games it, where there may be some opportunities there to lose your quarterback the amount of times that they did, um, well, they, I don't think any of us are. They were good offense. Yeah, they were a good offense. Yeah. Um, and they've upgraded their defense. Yes, they the, have. Uh, so, the, I mean, this, this team, I believe, is really, really, really good if they have two up. And Tua is very scary because if week one comes around and he gets, you know, I know he's put on a lot of weight. He's been hitting the weight room, and, and hopefully that will kind of just help with what kind of vicious hits he can take. But it is the one thing every time I'm drafting a Dolphin that I'm scared about because if he goes down to a concussion, you just don't know, is that the last time we'll see Tua ever again? And, you know, I don't – we don't know whether that would happen or not, but that's just the worry. Yeah, and I, I choose, and everybody can make their own decision, I choose to evaluate and draft based on Tua being healthy and being a part of this offense because I think the upside is so tremendous that to do otherwise would just be kind of like foolhardy and you, you miss out on so many explosive opportunities. Um, you know, Tua himself, when active, Led the NFL in yards per attempt, was a an effective fantasy player. Um, you know, had the six touchdown week, showing you the potential of this offense. You have a a really smart mind on that side of the ball. Um, 11th in points per game, sixth in total yards, despite missing those games. And he's got you know obviously the elite of elite in terms of weapons. You know, you you kind of can't comprehend a player on Tyreek Hill's team could average more yards per reception than Tyreek Hill, and yet Jalen Waddle did that. And so those two players alone unlock an entire offense that now features Devon A. Chain, Jeff Wilson, and Mostert are still there. They added um, <clears throat> Chosen Anderson and Braxton Berrios uh, yes. to this team. And so, and they didn't lose much. Mike Gesicki wasn't heavily involved, and Trent Shurfield wasn't heavily involved. So, you know, there's a lot to like about their opportunity this year. I, I, I would agree with you. I, I know I gave the concerns on the concussion stuff, but I'm. 
I, I hesitate, and then I click draft. I've been drafting, you know. It's like a, a little pump fake, but then you take the shot. Absolutely. I draft a lot of Tua. I draft a lot of Waddle and a lot of Tyreek and a lot of A-Chain. I, this is an offense and a division. I like two of those things. The, <laughs> this, which, which two are you off of there? No, I was no, I oh, liked two. Yeah, of those things. I, I no, I, it was. I don't like I think drafting eight. I think it was an eight chain. Yeah, comment. yeah. Which yeah. Mike? Why don't you take some time to talk about um, his height and weight? <laughs> <laughs> Look, so it's it's un, it, it feels unfair to to the man Devon A chain who had a prolific college career, but he's smaller. I know we're essentially a, a sub one hundred ninety pound running back. We haven't seen historically a bunch of success for players who ha are in that physical stature at the running back position. Granted, we don't see a lot of those players just drafted overall or even make it onto an NFL field. So maybe he is special. Maybe he is different. But it's 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 really tough when you have – like Raheem Mostert is old, but he's – Still crazy fast. And Jeff Wilson, when actually healthy, Jeff Wilson's a good running back who is reliable for this team. They traded for him. Uh, the Dolphins traded for Jeff Wilson like the middle of last year. And Jeff Wilson immediately went into being essentially the leader of the timeshare. So it would just, it would surprise me if Devon A. Chain is truly the running back that you want on your fantasy teams from Miami. I think. Uh, this is an ambiguous situation. I want to take some chances on. So if if you're on if you're in the A chain camp, go okay, go go draft him. But uh, for me, it's Jeff Wilson, who I have ranked the highest of the three. But I do think that you should be taking a chance, a late chance on at least one of these guys in almost every single one of your drafts because you're these are all of them are after the tenth round. And for a running back who could. If they if they change the system and have a primary running back for this high powered of an offense, there is there that would be a huge reward for a double digit round running back. I just want to give a lay of the land here as we talk about all three of these backs. In so much as Devon A. Chain is a rookie running back for Miami, they drafted him this season. Mike and I have him in the fifties. Uh, we see him as a weapon that is probably better on the football field. Than he is in your fantasy roster. Yeah, it's not a lot of volume. Uh, and Jason is he's really the one that is well ahead of ADP here at RB twenty four. Um, Mike, I I heard your argument against A chain, and it reminds me a lot of kind of why you were cautioning people about Javante Williams and the severity of the injury when we were discussing him on our last show, which was just like it's a reasonable take. The historical evidence. It it also lands equivalent to Jason's arguments against Dalton Kincaid. Like you you have to make the the case of special, the argument right. of special on Devon A. Chain to presume him as a top twenty four type of running back, um, which is you know that's a line that you I mean you could take that shot if you believe that Mike McDaniel is going to use him in that way. If you don't believe in Jeff Wilson and Raheem Mostert. All of those things are, are factors here. And, you know, Mostert and Wilson, I'll remind people, they were both given uh, renewals on the contract to come back this offseason pre-A-chain drafting. So I think all three will be involved. And as someone who had Mostert and, and Jeff Wilson, I'll be honest, that sucked last year. Yeah, it's gross. From, from the moment that, like, Jeff Wilson was traded over. Like, I had – Mostert was a steal for me in drafts at the beginning of the year. But the second they traded for Jeff Wilson, it was like – touchdown roulette if you got the one that scored you had a happy day and if you didn't you were like crap and it was almost always the guy you didn't expect going into that game yeah, everything, the guy on my bench. Would, everything would lead to one being the right guy and it was the wrong decision this is why if i'm taking a shot on one of them which i agree with mike you need to take a shot on one of them i lean towards a chain because i don't think you need the touchdown necessarily or the goal line opportunity from a chain Moster is super fast. He's four four three. He he's lightning yeah, he on the big field. Plays last year. Yeah. Devon A chain is other world. He's four three two. So when when you talk about he is an outlier. Like I don't bet on guys his size. I bet completely against running backs at a hundred and sub ninety pounds. Like, it just doesn't work out historically. Evidence is against it. It would have to be a special situation and a special talent. That's just what I see here. I see a four three two guy who landed in the perfect one cut system with Tyreek and and uh, Jalen Waddle, and it's just like if you give this guy a crease, 
he gone. Even on an NFL field, he gone. That's he a may, sixty yard he touchdown. May, he may land in the fourth row though after the first hit. That's the only, <laughs> it's the only yeah. risk. But, no, it, look, I'm looking forward to watching Miami. Like, I'd like – Yeah. This is a team that I think, you know, if you talk about pessimism or the win total for Buffalo, like, there's a world where we're talking about Miami and Buffalo battling for this division later sure. later in the season. All right, let's talk about New England. Eight and nine last year. I can't believe they're eight and nine. Um, you know, I'm going to describe New England to you. I'm going to paint a picture for you. If Buffalo is like a uh, is like a, a beautiful meadow that you've hung on your hall in your hallway, you know, bright colors. The Patriots feel like the upside down. Mm, sure, like that. It's like desaturated environment. Like there's something. There's a malaise feeling about the Patriots right now. Eight and a half win total last year, down to seven and a half this year. Mac Jones doesn't get people excited if they're in New England or if they're in fantasy football. Your best wide receiver is gone, Jacoby Myers. Your best running back is no. probably, I mean, one of your two though. running backs is gone into yes. Ian Harris. And, um, and, and your solution is a still injured Juju Smith-Schuster and Mike Kosicki, which we've gone to this well since Gronk of the multi tight end. Oh, John U. Smith's going to have his day and Hunter Henry, and now it's Mike Kosicki. I'm not trying to talk bad and discourage New England fans, but I just don't know the way out right now in this division. They're 32nd in passing attempts, 26 in total yards. Matt Patricia and Joe Judge were given the keys to the offense. Yeah, that was a big By problem. Bill Belichick. <laughs> And so that was a and now Bill O'Brien's there. So yeah, I mean that's much better. The it should be yeah. It, it, but do it you even have the personnel to to execute right? Like I I just don't know if the answer is yes. No, I I completely get it. I think that the majority of people are pessimistic on the Patriots' outlook. If you look at where Mac Jones is being drafted by the fantasy community, he's just he's like the last starting quarterback that anyone will touch he's uh, you know in 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 underdog leagues you can get him after guys that you're not even sure they're you the starting after quarterback the, after the draft is done <laughs> yes. like they just let they let you have an extra roster uh, spot and they just slide him on and so i think that's indicative of that talent of the fact that you know you've got an injured juju we don't know i, I have been drafting quite a bit of uh Tyquan thornton uh, in best ball because I, his, his speed and his necessity in this offense as a year two wide receiver uh, could hit. What you're hoping for here is that Bill O'Brien changes things drastically because you saw Mac Jones, his rookie year, show signs of being a good quarterback. Like, he was not bad. And then last year, you saw, instead of a step up, frustration across the board. Mac Jones screaming at the sideline, uh, yelling at them to throw the ball down the field. Like, why won't you let me throw the ball down the field as everything's just dink, dunk, dink, dunk, just drop it off down low. And zap, 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 Yeah, and it was, <laughs> yeah. it was crazy because when Zappy came in, they were like, here, let's call some plays down the field. So Mac Jones was frustrated, but he's got Bill O'Brien coming in. The hope is that you open it up. The... The bet is against New England, though, based upon the fact that uh, they have the hardest strength of schedule, according to Warren Sharp. They have probably the most difficult division uh, to play in and not a lot of talent on the offensive side. So for fantasy purposes, it's Ramondre. Yeah, it's Ramondre. Ramondre yeah, and maybe that's your, your shot. I mean, you could take the Juju or Parker or Thornton, like Jason said, late, 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 late best ball but this is a good defense too they're eighth in yards allowed fewest rushing touchdowns allowed that's the recipe that's the bill belichick mm -hmm. way to win so they're not bringing sexy back is what i'm saying no no but mike it, does have ramondre ridiculously high in his rankings i do uh because you you mentioned the the player they lost damian harris is gone and damian harris is a good running back the other guys that are on this roster we're talking about Ty Montgomery, who maybe he's in the plans. Maybe he was in the plans last year, but uh, got injured right away. And, I mean, is also – he's quite old. I mean, <laughs> Kyle, look up how long Ty Montgomery has been in the league because it, it feels like – It was 1976 for, was the rookie year. It feels like forever. And then it's Pierre Strong and Kevin Harris, two later round guys. Uh, so, yeah, so Ty Montgomery has been in the league since 2015 when he was a wide receiver back then. I just – 
this is like looking at the depth chart. Bill Belichick likes to to you know destroy fantasy hopes and dreams. I don't know that they have a. I think I don't think they can. I think you have to put Ramondre in third most targets, fourth most receptions, third most evaded tackles. Like the guy is is a tremendous running back, and he's he first needs most, to be the, the the engine of the offense. First most fumbles that ruin my playoffs. <laughs> um, sure. No, Ramondre. If 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 I had not made the bet that they would add somebody, which was entirely made because of this depth chart, you know. That was a mistake right now. Now they're still in contention for like Dalvin sure. Cook and Zeke or some but like we're all staring at the depth chart going, um, you know, what happens if Ramondre goes down? Like he he missed some time last year. He missed at least a game, um, to my recollection. So there's no one. It's Ramondre as an offense right now. Which now, he the, did not miss a game. He played uh I think he might have been banged up in one of them, but man, he Yeah, he it, he felt like he went off the field a couple of times. Uh, sorry, just to, to go back also to the Dolphins because we were having a big running back discussion. There was a rumor out there that Dalvin Cook has an offer mm -hmm. currently from the Miami Dolphins. It's not – obviously, it was, if, if the offer does exist, it is not the offer that Dalvin Cook wanted financially, but it's worth bringing up that the Miami Dolphins are – still in on the Dalvin Cook sweepstakes. Yeah, definitely worth bringing that up. And if he signs, then what we said about taking a yeah, shot on the other guys, just, just, just throw that away. Yeah, forget about that. All right, um, let's talk about, uh, I think, a very oh, man. polarizing, exciting, interesting team, uh, the Hard Knocks team of the year, the New York Football Jets, who went 7-10. and 10. Their win total was five and a half. So they, they last year, despite all the tumult and Brees Hall's injury and Zach Wilson and um, everything we we were watching, they beat their win total. Their projected win total this year is nine and a half. Um, this and they've the, they're rebuilt. They're entirely rebuilt, and and their defense, Robert so Sala, good. It, it's so fun to watch. Um, I cannot wait for Hard Knocks. Mm -hmm. The amount of players that I'm interested in seeing in there is not just the whatever goofy Aaron Rodgers drama you're going to have. There's going to be the backup quarterback and Zach Wilson hanging around. Um, Sauce. He's like one of those sucker fish uh, that's on the, the – <laughs> oh, no. Is that on the whales or the <laughs> – Oh, you thought you were talking about the tank, the guys that the, – no, the no, 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 no. The ones that like hang around the sharks and they oh, just eat oh, the they, extra they stuff. They swim with them. They swim with the okay. shark and the shark gets all the big food and they yeah. just have the leftovers. That's Zach Wilson. And then uh, you've got Garrett Wilson, who we all adore. I yeah. mean, he, this guy's a an absolute gamer. Um, you've got Sauce Gardner, mm -hmm. who's just electric. And and I want to see Robert Sala and the and the coaching staff. And, um, you know, they added Alan Lazard and Randall Cobb and McCall Hardman along with, um, you know, just one of the best quarterbacks of all time. So – it's hard for me to decide. I'll be honest. I'm going to preview the end of this show. I can't decide between the Jets. And Miami. And Miami. And and I think Ooh. the Jets could win this division. Oh, wow. Spicy. I do. I, I, I'm not going to – I don't think I'm going to predict that. But I think – But if it happens, three, you're going to say, remember, I, 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 I did it. say yeah. – I did mention that I thought it could happen. Yeah. I guess my point is this. I think three teams in this division could win the Super Bowl. I really do. Wow. I think the Jets, the Dolphins, and, and Buffalo could win the Super Bowl. You're going to make a lot of people happy when you say that. Well, not the Patriots fans. <laughs> well, they're not happy already. You have enough. You, yeah, you, you, you have enough wins. You take, why don't you take 20 years off and then come back to the table? Some of us have none. You need competence at quarterback. And if you get competence at quarterback, this team wins 10, 11 games. If you get excellence at quarterback... They might win 12 or 13. Yeah, you're not getting excellence at quarterback. <laughs> In Aaron Rodgers. In Aaron With Rodgers. Garrett Wilson. That I just, doesn't make any he's, sense. He's he's one year removed from, from back, back to back, back MVP, MVP seasons. How many years removed was Peyton Manning from being unbelievable? When, That's not that, a good yeah, call. That's not a good call. Peyton Manning physically disintegrated in front of us. Aaron Rodgers could still throw the Tom ball. How about Tom Brady going to Tampa a couple years removed from an my, MVP? My point is, I thought Aaron Rodgers looked like he took a step down last year. He, Yes, I realized two years ago he was an MVP, but last year he didn't look the same. He didn't look as good. He didn't drive the ball down the field as much. He didn't see the field as well. Like I'm saying, 
I think we saw the beginning of the progression where he's no longer the MVP first ballot. I mean, he's a first ballot Hall of Famer. I'm not taking anything away from his career. I'm saying at this stage, is he still one of the three best quarterbacks in the league? I don't think so. How? What does last season look like if Devontae Adams is running up the side of the, the Much, field? much better. Uh, I don't know I'm if we sure could make I mean, better. I mean, it's got to be a lot better. I mean, that's a hard part, right? We went into last year doubting him fantasy-wise because he lost – one of the best wide receivers in the game. I can't imagine. Yeah. I mean, Garrett Wilson's penciled in for a 1,100 to 1,500 yard season. Yeah, I, I obviously it would have been better with Devontae Adams. But my point is, if we're talking about him as an elite of the elite, one of the top three, top five, got, Patrick Mahomes lost Tyree Kill last year. Maybe it was fine. Sure. It, it, I mean, so. Uh, it would have been easier with Devontae Adams, but I just, on the field, like film wise, I just thought he looked not as great are you and, happy that he's there for Garrett Wilson yes because he if you talk about Zach Wilson versus Aaron Rodgers Aaron Rodgers is going to look like uh Patrick Mahomes I mean <laughs> that the the gap is awesome so there's a reason why the win total is tied with the Dolphins and it's you know up at nine and a half and their defense is great they've got the weapons and they have certainly a quarterback that can get it done but I'm speaking from a winning a Super Bowl and fantasy value, will he, one, need to really score a ton in the passing game with this defense? And will he provide enough? I, Garrett Wilson is being drafted like the one-two turn right now, you know, early second round. That I, is a little scary to me. I, I believe in the pass talent. attempts last year. Seventh as a team. Uh, despite being that good of a defense. They're 29th in points per game. So that, that'll that be the gamble, right? Uh, Jason, if you were going to draft in fantasy, it's your, it's your last uh, – one of the last picks of your draft, and you're gonna, you've are gonna you waited on quarterback, and you have to decide between uh, these three uh, gentlemen, uh, Aaron Rodgers, Russell Wilson, Deshaun Watson, put them in order. Um, I would go – I'm going to go with my rankings, which are Russell Wilson, Deshaun Watson, Aaron Rodgers. Okay. Mike, uh, do you do you paint a rosier fantasy picture for Aaron Rodgers, or are you just more excited as the team as a whole? I'm, I'm very excited for the team, and the not only did you have Aaron Rodgers, you know, uh, Devontae Adams was gone. I had hoped that Alan Lazard could step up, which Alan Lazard had, had a pretty good year. Christian Watson – who we remember how great the year was for him because he had a breakout campaign for fantasy. Like the guy was on and off the field, m missing games because he was injured. So we, we didn't, you didn't have a f like a full cohesive offense here for Aaron Rodgers. And it's you, it it's kind of funny because of how bad Nathaniel Hackett was of, as the head coach for the Denver Broncos. But Hackett was the OC for three straight years in Green Bay, including two of the years where Aaron Rodgers was the MVP. Nathaniel Hackett is now the offensive coordinator for the New York Jets. So I'm I'm not saying I'm I'm pushing all my chips back in on Aaron Rodgers of like because if if you're if you're 100 percent in on Aaron Rodgers, it makes taking a late round quarterback extremely easy because I can just I don't even have to think about it. I punt and then I get Aaron Rodgers really late. Here, here's uh, something to think about with Rodgers, with Brees Hall, which, Jason, you've talked about maybe him being overpriced right now, uh, not knowing how the, the health is going to uh, impact the beginning of the season. Garrett Wilson and company, all of these, uh, all of this optimism around the offense. Here's, here's my biggest concern about drafting these players right now. It's the schedule. And I've talked about this with Brees Hall before, but they begin the year with three brutal defensive matchups. So if you are pulling the trigger – I wouldn't draw final conclusions after Buffalo, Dallas, New England to start the season because those might not be. Now, if they go out and they take it to those teams uh, right out of the gate with a brand new offense and a brand new quarterback, then I'll be I'll be proven. Uh, I'll be very impressed. But that is a tough start to the year, and then they go to Kansas City. Or, they, I'm sorry, they play Kansas City at home in Week Four. So. Those four matchups, I remember thinking about this when it came to even Brees Hall's start to the year because he's going to have reps limited easily. They're not going to give him 25, 26 carries in week one. So the first three or four weeks may not tell the whole tale for this offense, and that could be the difference between 
you know, Miami and New York finishing second in this division. Yeah, yep. the the end of the season schedule is really really nice from them from a travel right. perspective, uh, and so, the matchups I think beyond yep. about week eight. Yeah, so uh, there was a lot of kind of conspiracy theory when the NFL schedule came out that the NFL was really trying to do some nice things for the Jets, but it is worth knowing those first few matchups because over the last couple of years, I think I think all three of us and maybe the entire fantasy community have realized really how important the beginning of the season is for whether or not your draft picks were good because you're going to end up trading guys and moving guys and adjusting your roster. How they start the season really impacts whether or not it was a good draft pick and then the value that is inherent And if you're not holding on to these guys all season. So maybe the Jets are someone to target you know, a way. month in. And maybe longer because they go to Denver after Kansas City and then they play Philly. So the first six weeks are brutal. And then a bye week. And then the bye week. And then maybe you're like buying Jets during the bye week. Maybe. I don't know. It, that's the hardest part is looking at that schedule and saying, there's even if a couple games go well, it seems on the surface very difficult, but then the back half of the year is juicy. It, it's pretty juicy. So uh, something to consider. Brees Hall, right now the team has said Michael Carter has the uh, – right now, he's the number two. And then you also have Zonovan Knight who played last year. You have Israel. A band of Kanda. Yeah, I gave Wait, you that chance. Do you have one of those? Yeah. yeah. A band of Kanda don't, don't want <laughs> none. Beautiful. You really need him for that to really hold up. He's got to do. He's going to have to do some stuff. Yeah, he's no, been making waves. We uh, we were pretty sad when the draft capital came in. Yeah, because that. I mean, that drop took you a while. I mean, moments, many moments. Uh, does Alan Lazard have uh, have your eye at all? A little bit. Uh, I think right now wide he's, receiver fifty one in ADP. Yeah, I mean, if Aaron Rodgers is good. If which is a very realistic, uh, you know, outcome, who is the wide receiver two here? And it's going to be Alan Lazard. It, Corey Davis has been certainly good enough uh, as an NFL wide receiver, but this team seems like they don't care that much about him. And Alan Lazard has been with Aaron Rodgers. He's the the most consistent guy that he has. He knows the system. He's been with Hackett. So this is like. It's it's almost opposite roles for Corey Davis and Alan Lazard. You think, oh, Corey Davis is the guy that's been there. But no, really, Alan Lazard's the guy that's been on this team, on this offense, right. with this quarterback and this offensive coordinator. All right, let's let's uh, let's break it down. I'll give you my division winner. It's Buffalo. And then I'm going to go Miami, New York, New England. That is exactly what mine is as well. Mike? I will go Buffalo, ah. New York, Miami, New England. Okay. All right. Let's get into basketball breakdown. Best Ball Breakdown, presented by Underdog Fantasy. All right, a new segment every week leading into the season, looking at best ball. I know Jason is uh, knee-deep in another 600 to 800 drafts. I'm on the clock in three right now. And uh, today's topic is going to be the ADP price check segment, but for round seven. Uh, we did this a couple weeks ago, looking at round seven, looking at upside, looking at who fits your team based on how you built uh, or you normally build your team early and um, who you're targeting with picks 73 to 84 in best ball drafts right now. Mike, who's your uh, – who do you have your eye on? Sure. Uh, he's – it's a it's a tough player because I – is he good? I, I don't think we know just yet. But Rashad White, starting running back for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, a starting running back in the seventh round who saw 50-plus receptions and one of 11 rookie running backs over the last decade to do that. So, I mean, the, the his volume was was pretty nice last year. Didn't turn into a lot of production. Granted, that was Tom Brady, who historically gives his running backs uh, the ball all they can handle, and this will be a different offense. But it's still the Rashad White show, at least to begin the year, and to get a starting running back who could be seeing – I don't know, you know, 16 plus carries and then f four plus targets per week. I mean, that that's an outrageous level of volume that could show up potentially in the seventh round. I, when I looked at 
pick 73 to 84 right now in ADP on best ball, that was the first name that jumped out at me, especially because he's at the very, very bottom of that list. Um, But I'm going to go with uh, Jahan Dotson because he's in that list. And I think when you look at the other wide receivers around him, George Pickens, Gabe Davis, Quentin Johnston, Jordan Addison, Kadarius Toney, I have Jahan Dotson ahead of all of those guys significantly. It uh, doesn't mean that other players don't have opportunities, but Jahan Dotson is somebody that I think he is primed for a breakout season with a new offensive coordinator, with um, two new quarterbacks, maybe one will work out. But this is this is a thousand yard plus receiver, and I think that that is uh, kind of a conservative estimate for him this year with what this offense is going to try to do. Uh, part of me hopes it's Jacoby Brissett the whole time, and that they have some success. How dare you? Oh. <laughs> That was that was wonderful. Thank you. Um, so I I think you know those first four weeks scored a touchdown, then he got hurt, took him a while to come back, and he's being undervalued, and it's evident here. I mean, this is first round draft pedigree, first round uh, production. Like the 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 kid had a good year for the amount of time that he was on a football field, and he's surrounded like he's going behind Jordan Addison, who's I. We project that Jordan Addison is going to be good. I can't tell you for sure. Kadarius Tony, is he good? I don't. I don't really know. Gabe Davis, we talked about that. Is he good? I. I don't really know. But I'm. I do know that Jahan Dotson can already get it done on on an NFL field. Yeah, I do know about Jordan Addison though. That's the name I want to bring up <laughs> because Jordan Addison is a. Super, you've seen something that we haven't seen. He's no, because I've seen what you have seen. He's super good at football. He's a great wide receiver. He's a Blitnikoff Award winner, and he lands in a place where his opportunity from week one is going to be outlandish. Do you know that Adam Thielen ran? 103 more routes than CeeDee Lamb last year. Like He was number two in the league. He's gone. He goes into this role. He's not going to have harsh coverage on him with Justin Jefferson across the field. So I really like Jordan Addison for the chance. I mean, this is best ball, right? You're trying to find league winners in best ball. You're trying to find guys that can really explode. Because we haven't seen him and he's a rookie, there is the chance that he's Better than we hope, better than we expect. So um, he's one name, and then the other guy, I, I brought him up. What about the, worse than we expect and worse than we've seen? Is I that mean, a possibility? It's absolutely a possibility. It's a possibility with any of these guys. But we, you know, with, with Gabe Davis, right? Gabe Davis is a post-hype sleeper. Maybe, you know, it's good offense. There's reasons to say that that's a good pick. But we've seen him have opportunity and not come through. To your point. And uh, I'm I'm going to share information here off a tweet from Lucas uh, Winciel. Uh, last year, Kirk Cousins second in red zone pass attempts, second in pass attempts inside the ten. Adam Thielen fifth in red zone targets, fifth in red zone receptions, fifth in red zone, uh, fifth in receptions inside the ten. So if it's Addison, yeah, I mean, the there's op- going to be opportunity now. Maybe it's Hawkinson, maybe it's uh, uh, KJ Osborne, but. But the opportunity for someone to step up there is tremendous. It's a great landing spot for him. I was very excited when he went there. The other name I just want to bring up is because in the late rounds, you're looking for people that can crack your scoring lineup. You know, it's automatically done for you. And whenever a guy gets a touchdown, he's usually good enough to score for your roster. And the touchdown opportunities for David Montgomery, inheriting that Jamal Williams role, uh, Jamal Williams just had the most rushing attempts inside the five yard line of all time. He's, uh, n- you know, Jameer Gibbs is great, but Jameer Gibbs will not be used as the goal line guy there. He wasn't in college. He's small. He's not a pile mover. And they're going to bring David Montgomery in. And Jared Goff sucks around the goal line. Like, th- there's a reason that they kept going to Jamal Williams because their offensive line is great. They don't have to worry about turning the ball over, and they kept scoring touchdowns. I think David Montgomery in the seventh round is going to be an eight to, 12 touchdown scorer this year. All right, that was Best Ball Breakdown presented by Underdog Fantasy. You can get your first deposit matched up to $100 using the code BALLERS. Ballers. I'm looking forward to talking about that uh, NFC North division mm-hmm. and those Lions that you just mentioned. Mm-hmm. But you're going to have to wait. Also, expect some mayhem oh, oh. on Saturday. Oh, yes! Don't miss it. See you then. Goodbye. 
Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers.